Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 2.3 Flows of Energy and Matter. In this video, we're going to examine how ecosystems are linked through energy and matter flows and how human activities impact these vital processes. Let's get into it. Ecosystems are fundamentally connected by energy and matter flows. Remember the food webs we studied in topic 2.2? Those illustrate how energy flows from producers to consumers and to decomposers. Chemical cycling shown by the blue arrows represents how matter moves through the ecosystem over and over again, while energy flow shown by the red arrows is one directional. It enters the ecosystem, transfers, transforms, and then ultimately exits the system. The sun's energy drives these flows and humans are impacting them both locally and globally. This diagram shows how solar energy is distributed through Earth's systems. Only a tiny fraction, about 0.08%, is captured by photosynthesis, while most of it becomes thermal energy. Notice the human use component, which taps into fossil fuels. This is ancient solar energy that's been stored for hundreds of millions of years. As solar radiation or insulation enters Earth's atmosphere, much of it becomes unavailable for ecosystems. This energy budget shows how incoming solar energy is reflected by the atmosphere, clouds, and Earth's surface, while the remainder is absorbed by land, oceans, and the atmosphere. Looking more closely at radiation pathways, we see that about 31% of incoming solar radiation is reflected and not absorbed at all through processes like cloud reflection, ground reflection, and atmospheric scattering. The other 69% is absorbed by Earth through land, water, atmospheric, molecules, and clouds. Energy follows specific pathways through ecosystems. First, light energy is transformed into chemical energy through photosynthesis. This chemical energy transfers between trophic levels with varying efficiencies. And eventually, all that energy is transformed to heat and re-radiated to the atmosphere and ultimately out into space. Here, we see energy transfer between trophic levels. Notice how only about 10% of the energy moves from one level to the next. The rest is lost as heat. This energy pyramid shows primary producers capturing 100% of available energy, with subsequent levels retaining progressively less. A significant portion of solar energy is converted to heat. In this Earth energy budget, we can see how absorbed light is eventually re-radiated as infrared energy. This transformation follows the second law of thermodynamics with energy becoming less concentrated and available. The final pathway for energy is re-radiation of the heat to the atmosphere. Note the large red arrows showing energy leaving Earth's surface. This release of heat energy is really important for maintaining Earth's temperature balance and it's what drives weather patterns and ocean currents. Productivity measures the conversion of energy into biomass over time. It's always a rate, and it's typically measured in grams per square meter per year, but sometimes you'll see it in kilos per hectare per year for terrestrial ecosystems. This diagram shows how biomass decreases at higher trophic levels due to energy losses between transfers. Net primary productivity is abbreviated as NPP, and gross primary productivity is abbreviated as GPP. GPP represents the total biomass produced through photosynthesis, while respiration is the energy that is used by producers to maintain their living function. NPP is what remains. It's the actual growth that becomes available to the other organisms that eat those producers. Similarly, gross secondary productivity, abbreviated as GSP, is calculated by subtracting fecal loss, that's loss from pooping, from food eaten by consumers. It represents the total energy assimilated by consumers. Mr. G's ESS website has some excellent resources explaining these concepts if you want to check that out. Net secondary productivity, abbreviated NSP, equals GSP, or gross secondary productivity, minus respiratory losses. This represents new biomass created at consumer levels, the actual growth of consumer populations after accounting for the energy that they used in respiration. It's just like the productivity at primary levels, except we're talking about consumers instead of producers. Maximum sustainable yields are equivalent to the net productivity of a system. 
matter also flows through ecosystems involving transfers or movements from place to place and transformations, which is a change in state or a change in form. A sustainable yield is the amount of biomass that can be removed from the system without diminishing the system's natural regeneration rate. For example, let's consider these lions in Tanzania. If we've got a thousand lions and there are 78 lions born every year, and then approximately 48 lions die natural deaths every year, the natural income is 30 lions per year. Theoretically, 30 lions could be sustainably harvested or hunted every year without reducing the population. Although the optimal sustainable yield is typically about 50% of this to account for uncertainties such as a new disease outbreak or natural hazards or storm events that kill members of the population unexpectedly. The carbon and nitrogen cycles illustrate matter flows using diagrams that show storages or sinks and flows. In the carbon cycle, carbon transfers between locations and transforms between states. It goes from gaseous CO2 to solid biomass or fossil fuels. Storages in the carbon cycle include both organic forms, as in organisms and forests, and inorganic forms, such as the carbon that you find in the atmosphere or in soils or fossil fuels and in the oceans. Each storage holds carbon for different amounts of time, from days in organisms to millions of years in fossil fuels. Flows in the carbon cycle include consumption or feeding, death, and decomposition, photosynthesis, respiration, dissolving, and fossilization. These processes move carbon between different reservoirs or sinks in the biosphere. Similarly, the nitrogen cycle includes organic storages in organisms and inorganic storages in soil, fossil fuels, the atmosphere, and bodies of water. Most nitrogen exists as atmospheric nitrogen gas, which most organisms can't use directly. Flows in the nitrogen cycle include nitrogen fixation by bacteria and lightning, absorption, assimilation, consumption, excretion, death, decomposition, and denitrification. These processes convert nitrogen between forms that organism can use and forms that they can't use and back to forms that they can use. Human activities significantly impact energy flows and biogeochemical cycles. This energy flow diagram shows sources and uses of energy in the United States with fossil fuels dominating. Consider how these energy choices affect carbon and nitrogen cycles through inputs, outputs, and storage changes. When you're analyzing quantitative models of energy flow, you want to look for patterns in that numerical data. What energy sources predominate? In other words, what are the main ones? How efficiently is energy transferred between sectors? How might these patterns impact ecosystems through carbon emissions or land use changes? When you're constructing quantitative models of energy or matter flows, you want to make sure that you include all the major components with their numerical values. This example shows energy flow through a lake ecosystem with values in kilocalories per square centimeter per year. Analyzing the efficiency of energy transfer typically requires calculating percentages. These ecological pyramids show how biomass and energy decrease at higher trophic levels. In the energy pyramid at the bottom, only 16% of producer energy reaches primary consumers at the next level. To calculate gross primary productivity and net primary productivity, or GPP and NPP values, you want to use the formula NPP equals GPP minus R. Gross secondary productivity and net secondary productivity can also be calculated using a similar but slightly different formula. GSP equals the food eaten minus the fecal loss and NSP equals the gross secondary productivity or GSP minus R for respiration. Understanding these calculations help quantify energy flow through ecosystems. The formulas themselves are pretty easy to use. The trick is recognizing which data goes with which abbreviation. The trick is recognizing which data point goes with which abbreviation. If you're asked to discuss human impacts on energy and matter flows on your exam, you want to consider how agricultural practices, fossil fuel use, 
deforestation disrupt natural cycles. Harvesting biomass removes energy that's stored at molecular binds. Fossil fuel extraction occurs much faster than those fossil fuels are formed. Nitrogen-rich crop removal depletes soil nutrients unless they're replaced through natural soil amendments or commercial synthetic fertilizers. Finally, consider the international perspectives and philosophical questions. Human impacts on energy and matter flows cross borders. Emissions in one country affect climate globally. Deforestation can impact atmospheric circulation patterns, and overfishing depletes ocean food webs worldwide. Throughout history, cultures have recognized the sun's importance through mythology. These stories sometimes preserve knowledge before scientific understanding was written down. That's it for ESS Topic 2.3. Next time, we'll explore biomes, zonation, and succession in Topic 2.4. Until then, happy learning.